हरे राम हरे राम Jana Braja Jana Ranjana Yashoda Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana Yamuna Tira Vanachari Yamuna Tira Vanachari Jai Haradha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Nittai Gaur Hari Bo, Hari Bo, Hari Bo, Nittai Gaur Hari Bo. Jai Jai Prabhupad, Prabhupad. Prabhupad Jai Srila Prabhupada. Gaur Premanande Haribo. 
Nama Om Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Pristaya Bhutale, Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namane, Namaste Sarasati Devi Koravani Pracharine, Nirvishesha Shanyavadi Paschachade Satarine, Om Namo Bhagavate Vatu Devaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So we're reading Brihad Bhagavatam Rida. We're hearing of Narada Muni's travels to find out the devotee who's received the greatest mercy from the Lord. So in the course of his research, he'd come after Lord Brahma. Well, after Lord Brahma, he would send to Lord Shiva. And Lord Shiva, Hare Krishna, Lord Shiva then is telling him, go to Vaikuntha. The people in Vaikuntha, they're really the ones who've received the greatest mercy from the Lord. Vaikuntha devotees are always, they always relish increasing pleasure in the company of the Lord. So the, the distinction between the, the pure devotees in this world and the pure devotees in Vaikuntha are, or is, that in the, in the spiritual world, the pure devotees are able to associate directly with the Lord. The pure devotees here in this world, they associate with the Lord in their heart, but they don't get the physical association like what the devotees in Vaikuntha get. So this way, Lord Shiva is saying that these people in Vaikuntha, they're really the ones who are getting the greatest mercy from the Lord. So Mother Parvati is the consort of Lord Shiva. She's, she's there and she's hearing all of this. And she, uh, she, she, she wants to bring up the position of the goddess of fortune the consort of the Supreme Lord there in the spiritual world. And Mother Parvati said, she's the foremost among them all because she's the most dear to, to, to uh, she, is, she is especially dear to Lord Shiva. She's the ruling goddess of Vaikuntha and its residents. So Parvati being a woman and also being a partial expansion of the, uh, the goddess of fortune herself. Mother Parvati, she's a partial expansion of the goddess of fortune, Lakshmi or Sri Devi. So when she was hearing about uh, Lord Shiva in Vaikuntha, she was here, well, she was hearing about Lord Shiva, how he was praising Vaikuntha. And she decided that it would be nice to also praise the goddess of fortune, that she also de deserves to be praised. Not just only the residents of Vaikuntha, but among the residents of Vaikuntha is the goddess of fortune. And it is, it is the goddess of fortune who bestows her blessing on all the inhabitants in, Vai, in the spiritual world in Vaikuntha. All the inhabitants of Vaikuntha, they all receive the blessings of the goddess of fortune. But 
The difference is <laughs> they're all pure devotees. And when they get the blessings of the goddess of fortune, they don't take it as an opportunity for their indulgence in sense gratification. Unlike people here in this world, the ordinary person here in this world, if they get the blessings of the goddess of fortune, it's an opportunity for their sense gratification. But in the spiritual world, the inhabitants of Vaikuntha, they have the blessings of the goddess of fortune. She's happy to give them blessings, but they will only, only use the blessings which she gives them for the service of the Lord. They will not use anything for their own sense gratification. That is the difference. The inhabitants of Vaikuntha have no desire for sense gratification. They're all pure devotees. And so because they're pure devotees, they get the blessings of the Lord. Right? One who is a pure devotee, one who has taken shelter of the Lord, then certainly the goddess of fortune will bestow blessings on that person. Not only the goddess of fortune, but all the demigods bestow their blessings on one who is a pure devotee. Yashyasti bhaktir bhagavati akinchana sarvair gunais tatra samaste suraha harava bhakta shya kato mahadgana manor tena sati bhavato bhai. Right? What's the translation? You know the translation? Even though he's very expert in maintaining his family members, or he may be practicing the mystic yoga system and drilling the respiration, but if, if he is not a devotee, he has no good quality. He doesn't have any good quality. He remains struggling with his mind and senses. But one who is a devotee, the devotee of the Lord, they get the blessings of all the demigods. And the goddess of fortune, she's the most important of all these demigods. There's the blessings everyone wants. They all want to get the blessings of the goddess of fortune, Lakshmi. Of course, the goddess of fortune in this world, she is chanchala. <laughs> she's chanchal. She's restless. She doesn't stay in one place. You may get her blessings for some time. How long can you keep her blessings? Money comes, very hard to keep it. <laughs> How long can you keep it? So that is the nature of the goddess of fortune's blessing in this world. However, in the spiritual world, the goddess of fortune is very faithful to her husband. And she remains there faithfully with him. And she also bestows her blessings. And she's pleased to bestow her blessings on all the Lord's devotees. So this is a very nice aspect here. Everyone who knows the goddess, everyone who knows the goddess three knows that, knows that she is the beloved wife of Lord Vishnu. Indeed, one of her names is Hari Priya. She is worshiped with reverence by all the Vaikuntavasis to uphold the claim that Lord Vishnu's consort Sri is his most favorite devotee. Parvati will now describe her greatness in more detail. So Mother Parvati is going to establish the position of the goddess of fortune as being the greatest of the devotees there in Vaikuntha. Mother Parvati says, her mercy expands wherever she casts her sidelong, her sidelong glance. Thus the rulers of the various planets obtain their powers, their knowledge, their 
attachment and their devotion. Her mercy, you can see how everyone depended on the mercy of the goddess of fortune. All the rulers of all the different planets in the material creation, they're all anxious to receive the blessings from the goddess of fortune. And their, her blessings come in not only giving wealth, but also giving knowledge, detachment, and devotion. So all of these th different kinds of blessings can be achieved by the grace of the goddess of fortune. We tend to just think of the goddess of fortune just simply somebody who's going to solve our economic problems. And we worship the goddess of fortune to get her blessings. So Srila Prabhupada points out that the goddess of fortune is Chanchala, but she's very faithful to her husband. So if you worship her husband, if you worship the Supreme Lord, Narayan, then you will be sure to get the blessings of the goddess of fortune. She will be pleased. And Prabhupada talks about the Birla family. In India, the Birla family, they build temples to the goddess of fortune along with Lord Narayan. They're devotees of Lakshmi Narayan. And that's one reason why they're so wealthy, why their business is going on all right. So Mother Saras, Mother Lakshmi, uh, the goddess of fortune, Sri Devi bestows her blessings on the devotees. You want to get the blessings of the goddess of fortune? Worship Lord Narai, her husband. And we worship Lord Krishna, Lord Jagannath, no difference. Oh. So Mother Parvati, she is saying that the demigods only get their power by the grace of the goddess of fortune. It is thanks to the goddess of fortune that the demigods correctly understand the relative position of God and the finite living entities that they are given that they have given up interest in material enjoyment and liberation and that they have become devotees of the personality of godhead so that the devotees they give up the desire for material enjoyment and they worship the supreme lord we want to get the blessings of the goddess of fortune we have to worship her husband in the proper manner, the proper mood. We should recognize that the Lord is the supreme proprietor, the master, the enjoyer of all this cosmic manifestation. When we worship the Lord with the proper mood, then the goddess of fortune will be very pleased to bestow her blessings on all the devotees. Ignorant people like you who worship her with great respect. Oh, sorry, not ignorant. Ignoring people like you who worship her with great respect, she vowed to undergo severe penances to worship her beloved Lord, even though he was indifferent to her. So, Mother Lakshmi worships the Lord. We know in Vrindavan, Mother Lakshmi also goes to Vrindavan and she goes to Vrindavan to do austerities. Usually, Mother Lakshmi, her hands are like this open, 
giving blessings. But when she goes to Vrindavan, she's going to Vrindavan not to give blessings, but to pray for blessings. Mother Lakshmi goes to Vrindavan to do penances and austerities there. And she prays to the Brijbasi people for their blessings. There's one temple there of Lakshmi there in Vrindavan. And she's got her arms, the two palms together and prayer. She's praying to all the Brijbasi people, please bless me. And Mother Saras, Mother Lakshmi, she wants the blessings. And what blessing does she want? She wants to dance Rasa Lila with Krishna. She wants the blessing that she could enter into the Rasa dance with Lord Krishna. But of course, she can never get that position. That is never given to Mother Lakshmi, to Lakshmi. The goddess of fortune, she's the consort of Lord Narayan, but that doesn't give her the right to enter into the Rasa dance. To enter into the Rasa dance, she has to become a gopi. So the goddess of fortune, cannot give up her queenly opulence and become a gopi. That would be too much. That would be too difficult. Could you imagine taking a queen out of the palace and putting her in the village to help take care of the cows and to make cow dung patties? Yeah. You know, it would be very difficult for their the price. But that's the price. You want to enter into Krishna's rasa dance. You have to take birth in the family of the gopis. Even the Shruti Charas, the Vedas personified, they also wanted to dance rasa lila. And they came to Vrindavan. But they could not, they could not get into rasa dance not until they took their birth in Braja, in the family of the cowherd people. And the Shruti Charas also had to become gopis. And then only they could get, get into Rasa Dan. So that is the supreme position of the gopis. However, the goddess of fortune, Lord Krishna explained to her, that although she could not dance in rasa dance, she was given residence on the chest of the Lord. And there's a golden line on the chest of the Lord where the goddess of fortune resides. So this is for her benefit. So, Although people worship the goddess of fortune with so much awe and reverence and great respect, she herself goes to do penance and austerities to try to please her husband. The most perfect of chaste wives resides forever on the beautiful chest and follows him in all his incarnations. So Lord Narayan expands in many different forms, many different avatars come in this world. And wherever his different avatars come, then the goddess of fortune will also go with him in her appropriate forms. Just as Lord Narayan, he is the supreme form in the spiritual world. And so in different avatars, he will appear in different ways, showing different qualities, manifesting different opulences. So in an, in an appropriate manner, the goddess of fortune, she will also adjust her position and her nature so that she can be compatible with her eternal husband. So we see uh, Shiva, Parvati, 
Sita, Ram, and we see uh, Rukmini Krishna in Dwarka. So all of the different Lord's avatars, they all have the consort, the goddess of fortune accompanying him in his different forms. So that shows her chastity, that she's very faithful to her husband. So then the, then the sage, his mind vibrating with extreme delight, called out, All glories to you, O husband of the goddess Kamala, O Hari, Lord of Vaikuntha, glories to you, O Vaikuntha world, glories to all who live there, all glories to you, O Padma, Lord Krishna's beloved, O presiding goddess of Vaikuntha. So Lord Shiva is in ecstasy. And Narada, this is Narada's calling out. After hearing Lord Shiva and Parvati describe the glories of Vaikuntha, now Narada has become very ecstatic. So Narada wants to go to Vaikuntha. He wants to go there to meet them. But before he could leave, Lord Shiva said, just a minute, sit down. Don't go anywhere yet. You see, Lord Shiva is going to give him some more instruction. The so Lord Shiva tells him, he said, uh, you're so eager to see the dearest devotee of Krishna. You've lost your memory. <laughs> Lord Shiva says to him, don't you remember? The Lord of Vaikuntha is living right now in Dwarka. <laughs> so, Narada Muni, of course, Narada Muni should know that because he regularly goes to Dwarka and meets the Lord there. Uh, but Narada could now see the same. So, Narada could, he could go and see Narayan and Mahalakshmi without having to travel so far. If he was to go to Vaikuntha, that's very far, but he just has to go to Dwarka to see them. So, is, will, will he go there? Well, Lord Shiva is not finished yet. He's going to give more instruction. However, he tells him, Queen Rukmini is the goddess of fortune herself. And Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead. Rukmini's partial incarnations accompany Lord Vamana and the other avatars of the Lord. So Rukmini is the original goddess of fortune. And all the other goddesses of fortune they're all expansions of her. Narada has doubts that the goddess Mahalakshmi is appearing with Krishna. But Lord Shiva tells him, no, she's descended as a daughter of Bhishmaka Maharaj. But Narada may doubt that Mahalakshmi never leaves the side of the Lord. So Narada Muni, uh, Lord Shiva can answer that. He can say, well, Krishna is appearing on earth and Krishna is the Supreme Lord. So why is Lakshmi sometimes seen in the company of incarnations? Because these incarnations are also expansions coming from the Lord. 
Lord Vamana Dev, and then the Mahapurusha, Kapila Dev, all of these different forms. These are so the different Lakshmis who appear are avatars of Mahalakshmi. The original goddess of fortune is Mahalakshmi, the dearest devotees of the Lord in Vaikuntha. They've come from Dwarka. They've come to Dwarka. Rukmini is a perfectly complete divine consort of the personality of Godhead. She always serves as Sri Krishna's lotus feet. Because Sri Krishna is not a mere incarnation of Vishnu, but the source of all incarnations, Srimati Rukmini Devi is equally supreme. She is the source of all goddesses of fortune. So of all the gopi, Lord Krishna, of course, has many, many wives there in Dwarka. He has many wives. And of all the wives, he said eight are prominent. And from these eight, then Rukmini and Satyabhama are the most prominent. But Lord Krishna's most favorite wife is Rukmini. She was, of course, his first wife. And Krishna kidnapped her, stole her in the Rakshasa style. He came while she was supposed to marry Sishupal. So Queen Rukmini is always a very chaste and mild mannered wife. Sometimes Lord Krishna will try to make her angry. You know, they say that the pleasure in married life is the arguments between the husband and wife. That's their greatest pleasure when they argue with each other. So Lord Krishna will try to make Rukmini angry. So in this Srimad Bhagavatam, it's described how one day Lord Krishna told Rukmini, that, you know, I'm not really fit to be your husband. You know, when, when I kidnapped you for, and took you for my wife, at that time, there were many kings who wanted to marry you. There were many kings, and I'm just a cowherd boy. In fact, I don't even know if I'm a cowherd boy. I don't really know my origin. I don't have any cows. Yeah, I'm, in other words, I'm not qualified to be your husband. And at, at this time, Krishna and Rukmini were already grandparents. They already had their grandchildren, you know. But still, Krishna is enjoying these joking words with Rukmini. But when he says these things to Rukmini, she, you know, some ladies would get angry and you know, hit the husband, <laughs> you know, and, you know, they will really shout and argue with him. And, but Ruk, what does Rukmini do when Krishna, when Krishna jokes with her? Rukmini faints. She falls to the ground. It's just the thought of being separate from Krishna, because Krishna tells her, you should go and marry some other person. I'm not really fit to be your husband, you know. <laughs> and and the, just the thought of being separate from Krishna was unbearable to Rukmini. And she fell to the ground unconscious. And when she came back to consciousness, then Krishna began to apologize to her and saying that, no, I was only joking. It's not really, I didn't really mean it. But then Rukmini began to speak in the most wonderful philosophical manner, describing how everything Krishna said was actually true. And she said, actually, I'm not qualified to actually be your wife. It's, 
that I'm not qualified to be your wife. It's not that you're not qualified to be my husband, but I'm not qualified to be your wife. And all of these other men who wanted to marry me, you know, they were, they were just men with material bodies. You know, they're just men with beards and mustaches. You know, these, these kind of men that, that I didn't want those kind of men for my husband anyway. That I know you are the Supreme Lord and you have a body of eternity, bliss and knowledge and you are the Lord of the whole cosmic manifestation and you are not the servant of your senses. These other men were all just lusty men serving their senses. It was described at the time of the marriage of Rukmini, when she was going to the temple, when she was supposed to marry Sishupala, she was going to the Durga temple or the temple of Ambika to pray before the marriage. And the other princes would see her. They would, the princes would collapse to the ground. They would fall to the ground just to see her beauty, that she was so charming and so overwhelmingly beautiful. You know, just like Draupadi, you know, Draupadi also, she had this problem that the other, other men would become so mad after her. Like Jayadrat, you know, they were, and Jayadrat was so crazy for Draupadi. And just the smell from her body was so overwhelming. And you can see the perversion of that today, you know, women will buy perfumes and stuff like that, you know, to make their bodies have this aroma. But women like Draupadi, Rukmini, their bodies naturally had this aroma. It's like Draupadi, she came from the higher planets. She was a demigoddess. And Rukmini, she's the goddess of fortune herself, Lakshmi. So. You know, their bodies are just inconceivably beautiful and perfect, and they have all features necessary to attract <laughs> to attract the other sex. They're naturally endowed with all these things. So Rukmini, uh, she is uh, the perfect consort for Lord Krishna. And she is only, she's meant actually only for Krishna. When Ravana kidnapped Mother Sita, Lord Rama was so angry that when he looked across the ocean, the ocean began to boil. And all the fish and all the aquatics in the sea, they were all disturbed by the anger of Lord Ramachandra. And in the same way, devotees should be angry to see the wealth taken by the hands of so many Ravana-like men. Just as Ravana took Mother Sita who is the goddess of fortune. The same way today, so many materialistic men have captured Mother Sita in the form of the opulence of the material world, wealth. And they're utilizing it for their own sense gratification. So they're, they are like Ravana. The materialistic men today are just like Little Ravanas, sample Ravanas. So we should be angry to see the wealth in the hands of these men. You know, if Prabhupada saw you sit like this, you know, he will not be happy. He will tell you. Because it's mentioned in Nectar of Devotion also. One of the rules in sitting in front of the deities. We can't sit with their arms around their legs. So 
we should feel this mood just like lord ram wants to bring sita we want to bring sita back to lord rama we should capture the wealth and bring it for the service of the lord all the wealth actually belongs to the lord and it's meant for his service it's not meant for satisfying the senses of so many materialistic men it's meant for the service of the lord we have to bring it back we have to think like that so seeing the wealth in the hands of people we, this is the manifestation of mother sita the goddess of fortune of course materialistic men they cannot capture the real sita it was simply the maya sita who ravana took the maya sita was taken by ravana but we should understand the mood that mother sita is the property of lord rama all the wealth of the world is meant for the service of the lord sometimes people ask us they complain oh you spend so much money to dress the deities and to put build big temples and everything for the worship of the lord they say oh, you're spending so much actually we're we're not spending enough if they give us more money we'll spend more right whatever if we get we can spend more for the service of the lord this is proper use of wealth the proper use of lakshmi it belongs to the lord it's meant for his service we don't want to waste it in materialistic goals materialistic things so mother parvati is describing the glories of uh mother sita uh, mother shri or shri devi the goddess of fortune lakshmi but lord shiva says to narada muni he said i shall tell you a great secret so please listen i'm going to tell you a great secret he said there is a greater recipient of krishna's mercy greater even than your father meaning lord brahma or me lord shiva speaking and other servants greater even than garuda and greater even than the goddess of fortune and his name is pralad he is famous throughout the world as a dear most devotee of krishna so pralad is the next topic lord shiva is telling narada muni there's this one devotee pralad he is a very great devotee greater even than the goddess of fortune greater even than lord shiva greater and lord shiva is the greatest vaishnava but pralad is a greater devotee very special devotee try to understand the position pralad maharaj that pralad maharaj wherever he he doesn't need to go to the spiritual world because wherever he is that is the spiritual world wherever he is he's always so krishna conscious that it all becomes the spiritual world so there's no greater devotee than pralad we are hearing that this pralad it's so deep it's so exceptional that he's greater than all of these other servants so lord shiva says to narada muni you must have read about these things in the puranas you must remember that verse 
and he quotes a verse which says, Without saintly persons, for whom I am the only destination, I do not desire to enjoy my transcendental bliss or my supreme opulence. So this was spoken by Lord Narayan to Darvasa Muni. When Darvasa Muni was being chased by the Surasan Chakra, at that time he'd come to Vaikuntha. He wanted Lord Narayan to save him from the Sudarshan Chakra, which was chasing him, was going to burn him. At that time, Lord Narayan spoke to Dervasa Muni, the glories of his pure devotees. Lord Narayan said, I, I don't want to, to stay without the association of my devotees. Without that saintly association then I can never be satisfied. And that my opulences don't mean anything to me without the presence of devotees. Hmm. Right? You may have a lot of wealth. What can you do with it? Without devotee association, how could you enjoy it? The proper use for wealth, we, we build temples, just like Prabhupada told Ambarish, that boy, grandson of Henry Ford, he said, your duty is to develop Maya for it. So he was, that was his instruction from Prabhupada, that he should develop Maya for it. Of course, they, they planned so much for Mayapur that he couldn't do it all himself. <laughs> he had to get other people also there. Anyway, the construction is going on. But Prabhupada said, even if you don't have much wealth, if you just have a little piece of land, you can use it to plant Tosi, grow Tosi there. And in this way, you're using it for the service of the Lord. We want to use everything for the service of Krishna. And wealth is a diff it's difficult to use it properly. When Prabhupada would give, when people would come to Prabhupada with money, Prabhupada would say, put it in my book fund. And Prabhupada would often say also, he would quote Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati that better than building temples is to print books. That is a better use of Lakshmi. You build temples is okay, but better than that is to print books and give, distribute them. Mm -hmm. Prabhupada didn't worry too much about building temples. In Prabhupada's time, we didn't see many temples. Prabhupada opened the Vrindavan temple. He did do that. Prabhupada personally opened Vrindavan. Mayapur, we didn't really have much of a temple in Mayapur. They built, put a building up, but it was the lotus building. And then the basement was was the temple room. And then similarly in Juhu, in Juhu, Juhu didn't open until Prabhupada had already departed. Prabhupada left the world. Prabhupada left in November. Juhu temple opened 1978 in February. Huh? January was it? I was there. So we opened the temple in Prabhupada already departed, unfortunately. But Prabhupada directed the building. He said Bomb Bombay, Mumbai was the most important city. He said the most money and the most devotees at that time, anyway. At that time, he said the people are the most pious and the, they have the most money. So we should have a nice temple, opulent temple there. So in Vrindavan, in Vrindavan, it was, you know, just cement and plaster. But in Mumbai, probably say put marble. 
one in marble everywhere. You can see the guest house, it's all marble. Prabhupada wanted more opulence there than Juha. Right? Bombay was his office. Vrindavan is home. Bombay is office. Mayapur, place of worship. So using wealth is always a great challenge. To use everything properly for the service of Krishna. So that if we get wealth, best thing is to use it for Krishna. If we don't give it to Krishna, then we'll give it to the doctor. You give it to the lawyer. You give it to the policeman. And so many different people will come. They'll take the money away. The best thing is to give it to Krishna quick before you lose it. And definitely we'll lose it because money is chanchala. She's restless. She doesn't stay long. So when we get it, we use it. Use it quickly for Krishna's service. All right, any questions? They, most of the people are not so much interested in actually reading books in book form. And they are actually, mo now most of the things are there in soft form. So, uh, how exactly now at this current times, the um, uh, priority, of course, it can go into the spreading of knowledge, but uh, how exactly uh, the funds or the Lakshmi how it could be utilized, Maharaj? Well, you say people are not interested in reading books, but actually they are. People still read, you know. It's not every day people read on the, the mobile phone. And people do like to have books. Many people have their own library at home. Many people like to collect books. So, Prabhupada, he gave the example about how did communism come to India? And he said, that the Russians didn't come. He said, but that somehow the books came, some books came about communism. And that's how it came into India. So Prabhupada saw that the books are the means to actually distribute the knowledge and the philosophy and the way of life. That if people read the books, then they can understand Krishna consciousness. So we do, we do have to distribute books. Of course, people, Kali Yuga, they're lazy. They don't want to read, all right? That we see that. And some countries are more lazier than other places. Some people, some countries in the world, they don't like to read at all. You know, they won't read much. Hardly, if they read the newspaper, that's about as much as they go. And reading the newspaper, they just read the headline, you know, and more look at pictures. That's what they do. So to get people to actually read books, it takes a little bit intelligence, a little bit education has to be there. People have to... But... Even people who don't read books and who didn't get much education, they can change by the mercy of Krishna. And we do see people come to Krishna consciousness. You know, I've seen over the years that I've been in Krishna consciousness, I've seen people come to Krishna consciousness with practically no education. But somehow they became very learned. And they became learned, and even some of them went on to write books. 
<laughs> although they've had practically no education before becoming devotees. But come, they come to Krishna consciousness and they read Prabhupada's books and they get their education. They get education. Just, I, I, I know several people, they didn't know English, but they read Prabhupada's books and they learned English just by reading Prabhupada's books. And they, they, they went on to become very learned in the philosophy. So we do need to persevere with book distribution. We need to not only get people to buy the books, but we want to get them to read the books. So the courses and classes which we have are also very important. You know this Gita Gyan seminar, which is they're doing? I think is it Seshadri Puram they're doing? The Gita Gyan? A chapter a day. They have slideshow. It came from Bangalore. Somebody in Bangalore, he was he came up with this slideshow and a summary of each chapter. And for one hour, they can present one chapter. So you do a chapter a day. And this week, 18 days, you cover the 18 chapters. And so during the lockdown period, you know, for the last year, the year before, was very successful. And we had many people, many people take this course. And we did it in Malaysia. We did it in Thailand. We did it in some part of Russia a little bit. We tried. But it's, it's one way of somehow getting people to just try to understand more the Bhagavad Gita getting them to understand the Bhagavad Gita. And then also from the Bhagavad Gita, you can lead them into Srimad Bhagavatam. So that was the idea with the slideshow. They have one, two, three different stages of studying the Gita. You know, they have three levels. And the third level, they put in a lot of stuff from the Bhagavatam also. So we want to have these kind of seminars and things like that. It brings people into Krishna consciousness, get them to read the books. And with, with the technology which is available today, people don't need to come to the temple. And they don't need to read the book. They can have soft copy. Right? But they, they do need to read, they do need to hear. So they can have soft copy if they like. We can give them free soft copies, right? It's available, I think, online. The books are all available free online. Anybody who wants to read them, they can get them. So we do want to get them to start thinking. That's an important point, to get people to start thinking about things. What is this book about? What is the message? Krishna consciousness is in people, but we have to bring it out. We have to know how to bring it out of them. So that's the difficult part. Uh, even Prabh Prabhupada would say, I, I, know the f I know the formula, but I haven't been able to uh, uh, bring it out yet, to yield it. But I know the, the formula, Trinada Pithani Chena, you know, chant the holy name, be humble like a tree, offer all respects to others. This is the formula for Krishna consciousness. But how to get that, how to bring that out of people, how to, how to, you know, work it together that it will manifest. That's a difficult part. So we want to think how to utilize everything in Krishna's service. So we're doing pretty good. <laughs> we're spending a lot of money. 
many temples around the world, everywhere, and so many places also. Development going on, different plans, some places planning farming communities, other places schools. Just yesterday, we took, they took me to see the, the school of the Madhva Acharya line. Vijapitha, yeah, so we saw there 300 people, 300 young students there, young men studying, studying Sanskrit, free education, very wonderful, very good. Our ISKCON schools are not free. Quite expensive, actually. I met one devotee, one devotee, he was living in Mayapur, he was working, he said he worked, he has a job, you know, he doesn't have his own business, so he was working, he makes 8,000 rupees a month, that's about average pay there in Mayapur. So I said, with 8,000 rupees, he said, I have two children, he said, I cannot put children, can you know, they have the international school, no way. They have the national school, even the national school, expensive. He said, it's not cheap. He says, quite, quite, you have to pay money to get in, you know, to get into schools or something. They have to pay some money to get the child admitted into school. And then you have to pay every month also. So he said, I just put my, ch my children have to go to government school. Hmm. So, you know, these are some problems. It's always difficult. And Prabhupada also said he didn't know what to do. He said, we have so many householders, how to maintain them. You know, he said, I, he said, I don't know. This is difficult. How to maintain, just to maintain temples is difficult. But if you have to maintain householders as well, <laughs> then it's even more difficult. Because householders have children and then there'll be so many expenses. That's why Bhakti Charu Swami, Bhakti Charu Swami, he tried to do things like uh, start businesses, you know, at Ujjain. He wanted to have different businesses there. And he wanted, he had some, some enterprising disciples. He wanted them to utilize their ability to begin some businesses, some companies. And like that, it creates employment. And devotees can work together with other devotees in a devotional atmosphere. So we hope in the future, those things will come about more. Try to make nice arrangements so that people can also be supported. It's, it's so, so many challenges, so many difficulties. Unfortunately, of course, Bhakti Charu Swami has left us, but still the, the, the land is there, the project is there, you know. I don't know all of his plans, what was, what he wanted to do. There's so many things we have to think about. We have to, of course, who am I? What can I do? I, I can't do anything, but in the future, we hope that these things will be taken care of. Just like Madhvacharya, they've had 800 years to come to that level, right? When did they start that school? 62 years, hmm? good. Yeah. So they maintained it, nice. Bhaktivinoda Thakur also had a school. You can see the, the school there in Mayapur. There's a big school there. I don't know, it's still going on. That's cool. You know, you know that's cool. 
Yeah, yeah. All right. It's not the building. I don't know what goes on. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada, Ki Jai. Maybe we should do more Lakshmi Puja. Hare Krishna, devotees. This is the name of Bhakti Vigna Vinashana Sima Samaraj, Ki Jai. Jagannath Vila Deva Sudharma, Ki Jai. We'll wait for Prabhupada's question. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Hare Krishna devotees, thank you for joining uh, Nitya Bhava Sivaya. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Mancha Kalpatar Vesya, Kripa Sindhu Nivacha, Patitana Pavan Nimbi Vishnu Nimbi Vunamar, Ananta Kodi Vishnu Vrindaki, Grantarai Bhagavatam Kija.